1,4-Dioxane and PFAS chemicals represent one of the greatest water quality challenges of our generation. These chemicals have been used for 70 to 80 years and unfortunately and tragically have become ubiquitous in our environment and our drinking water supply. Much is being done to set regulations and develop technology to filter out these chemicals as well as preventing them from contaminating drinking water in the first place but we have a long journey ahead. There are really two sources of 1,4-Dioxane. One is it was used as an industrial solvent many years ago in industry, and the second is it comes from products. It's not an ingredient in product, but rather it's a byproduct of the manufacturing process. PFAS chemicals are used in so many products, things like stain guard, Teflon, firefighting foam, food wrappers, believe it or not. So there is a myriad of sources for both 1,4-Dioxane and PFAS chemicals that enter into the water supply, enter into the human bloodstream, and into our environment. And it is our obligation to meet that challenge and protect public health. Um, so 1,4-Dioxane and PFAS have very unique chemical properties, so, which makes them very difficult to remove by conventional water treatment processes. For example, 1,4-Dioxane is highly soluble in water and they do not stick very well to the regular water filters that we use for treatment. So as a result, we need advanced treatment processes to break them down. With regards to PFAS, uh, we are actually dealing with a group of chemicals and not just one or two chemicals, unfortunately. Although in New York State, PFOA and PFOS is regulated, um, there are thousands of other PFAS that's also present in the water along with these two chemicals. And there's no one technology that could efficiently remove all these PFAS chemicals. Um, for PFOA and PFOS, which are currently regulated, um, carbon filters can efficiently remove them, but only for a short period of time. Other constituents in water can disturb the performance of filters, needing the filter materials to be frequently replaced that adds to the cost of operation and maintenance. So these are some important challenges in treatment of PFAS and 1,4-Dioxane. These chemicals are very serious toxic chemicals. They're associated with, unfortunately, a wide variety of illnesses, such as thyroid cancer, testicular cancer, breast cancer, liver damage, damage to the immune system, low birth weight, developmental problems with fetuses and infant children, and more. They are not chemicals that should be taken lightly, and that's why there's been so much work to bring down the drinking water standard and implement unified standards across America. That's a challenge that should be based on science, based on facts, but it needs to be done. Yeah, so we did a study essentially looking at 1,4-Dioxane and water coming into households and what was coming out of the households. And what was really surprising is that, you know, in good news, the homes we looked at, the water supplies were below the standard for the levels of 1,4-Dioxane. Um, but the water coming out was actually well above it and some, several fold above it. Uh, and there's only one that, way that can happen, and that is household products contaminating the water or in the wa getting into the water and then going back into the environment. So really proof that um, household products or we know are enriched in 1,4-Dioxane and enriched enough that they're increasing the amount of 1,4-Dioxane discharged into the environment. One of the challenges is like the filtration techniques, they just remove PFAS but they don't destroy them. So they're still captured and accumulated in the filters. So what happens to that? So you need some type of technology to break them down, otherwise they just accumulate in the environment. The center is working on both sequestration and destructive approaches. Like the current filters, they just remove PFAS physically from water, but they are still accumulated in your filters. But the center is also working on developing technologies to destroy the PFAS that's accumulated in these filters. So in a, in, in a sense, uh, like complete destruction of PFAS can only be achieved by a combination of treatment processes. You need to capture it first from the contaminated water, and then you need to apply a different technology to break them down so that it doesn't go back to into the environment. There's over 200 million people in the country with uh, levels of PFAS that are too high in their drinking water supply. 
and over 58,000 places that have been contaminated with PFAS. Um, and 1,4-dioxane is a, defined as a probable carcinogen by US EPA and is showing up in drinking water supplies uh, and you know, it's a serious issue. Well, these compounds are very persistent and very difficult to break down. Um, you know, particularly the PFAS compounds, you know, they're called forever chemicals for a reason. And uh, the carbon fluorine bonds in these compounds are some of the strongest uh, known to science. And so that makes it very, very hard to break down. And with 1,4-dioxane, um, there's lots of things that you can do to treat drinking water. Uh, but most of the standard treatment approaches don't work for 1,4-dioxane. So we've had to rely on some innovative processes that are pretty expensive and pretty elaborate. Yeah, I mean, the Center for Clean Water Technology is innovating on new technologies, new approaches for removing these compounds from drinking water supplies. And it goes for every, everything from absorbing them and pulling them out to actually destroying the compounds entirely. Um, and the idea is to innovate in a lab like this and discover what works best and then move to what we'd call a pilot scale experiment where we can work with drinking water suppliers to see how that works at that scale and then hopefully have something that can be used across the country and really across the world. So the current technologies are not efficient in treatment of 1,4-dioxane and PFAS. So the Center for Clean Water Technology is improving the current technologies to remove these contaminants. In addition to that, we're also developing advanced analytical technologies uh, to measure these chemicals at very low levels. That also allows us to remove, make the treatment processes more efficient because one of the challenges is in the detection of these chemicals at the low levels. Um, the EPA has recently uh, issued a health advisory level at near non-detect levels and current technologies are not able to detect them at such low levels. So we have, Center is also invested in, in improving the analytical capabilities to measure these emerging contaminants in water. Yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, we get to the point where the forever chemicals are no longer forever, right? And that is to say that we've got a way to destroy those chemicals, break those bonds, and, you know, we're left with just the fluorine, for example, um, you know, and, and it's no longer a serious threat. And, and on the other side, the, you know, that those compounds are no longer being used. I mean, I think to address the issue of these emerging contaminants in drinking water, we need to take a twofold approach, at least. Firstly, we need to cut off the source. And right? if we know what the sources are, we've got to stop that because, uh, you know, if we don't, this will just continue to be an issue. And then, you know, on the other side, we need to do the research to come up with the best ways of removing this from our water supplies. Um, you know, in some cases, it's going to be treating the drinking water itself. In other cases, it may be treating the contamination um, exactly where it exists in the environment. We're very hopeful that with public awareness, public engagement, and also with good science like is being done at the Center for Clean Water Technology, we can address this problem and we can have cleaner, safer drinking water for the future. We're going to have to really work hard to get there. It's going to take public support. It's going to take money from the federal government and it's going to take political will and good science. But I think all those things can be attained and this is not a luxury item. This is a necessity. We must do it.